Hello and welcome to NOV Live. I'm Michael Gaines and glad you are joining us today as we continue our ongoing conversation with technical experts and uh, subject matter experts about technology and innovations in the energy world. So glad you're joining us as we uh, really dive in and talk about some really innovative technology coming from the completion side of the business. So uh, definitely will be a, a really good conversation. And we have a, a great guest who's joining us today. So uh, look forward to having you join us uh, in today's conversation. And while you do, feel free to let us know in the comments where you're watching us from and where you're joining the conversation from. We always like to see uh, where in the world you're joining us from and, uh, and uh, always makes for a, a great conversation. So please do that. So before we jump into our conversation today, we want to go ahead and bring in Shelby Domain to talk about additional ways you can be a part of today's conversation, as well as provide insight and feedback mm -hmm. for future topics or, or even on, on today's show. So, hey, Shelby, good to see you. Hey, Michael, it's great to see you as well. Uh, so, yeah, whether you're a first time viewer or maybe a long time viewer of the show, uh, there's a couple different ways that you can get involved. And the first way, uh, maybe the easiest, is simply by commenting below. So whether, you're, again, you're on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, uh, go ahead and type in your comments. I am in the comment sections throughout the entire show, uh, looking at everybody's questions, everybody's comments, like Michael said, uh, where, they're, where you're tuning in from. Uh, so go ahead and type your question there. And at the end of the show, we are going to do a Q&A live with our expert um, with your questions. And then after the show, if you would like to reach out to us and maybe ask any other questions or give us any topic ideas even, there's a couple different ways that you can reach out to us uh, then as well. The first is you can send us a quick message via email, and that email is socialmedia at nov.com. So it's on the screen now if you'd like to send us a quick message. Um, and then, uh, again, longtime viewers will know this is my favorite way, but we also have a phone number that you can give us a call on. Again, that number is on screen now. It is country code plus one three four six two two three four seven nine nine. So you can give us a call. Um, basically, you, you'll leave a voicemail and you can stay anonymous or let us know uh, your name, maybe where you're from or where you work. And we would love to feature you on a future episode um, of the show. So those are a few different ways that you can reach out to us and let us know uh, your questions for us. Uh, but now is is uh, one of my favorite parts of the show, which is where we ask you a question. So it's time for Rig Geek Post of the Week. Rig Geek's Post of the Week. All right. So I got to be honest, I think this is one of the, the best questions we've had in a while for Rig Geeks. Um, I've heard it's maybe a little bit, I don't know if it's a hot topic, but it's definitely something that I've heard is widely debated in the community. So um, here I'm going to bring it up now. Um, according to the American Petroleum Institute, or API, uh, their definition of high pressure, high temperature, air, or H, uh, PHT well environments, um, what is the minimum required temperature rating and the pressure rating? And you can do, we actually have the answer in Fahrenheit or Celsius, PSI or bar. Uh, so whatever you think those uh, minimum required temperature and pressure ratings are for um, HPHT well environments. Go ahead and comment that below. And as a reminder, that's according to the American Petroleum Institute. So sure. um, I'm, I'm interested to see to see maybe some debate ensue in the comments. Well, uh, if there's debate, it's not something that I initiated. So we'll uh, we'll thank you for the, <laughs> the lively convo. No, that's good. That's a good one. Yeah, I. Uh, I, I'm I'm interested to see the the feedback as well. So cool. Well, thanks, mm -hmm. Shelby, and thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I will scroll through the comments here. So it looks like we've got uh, quite the crowd today. Looks like we've got uh, folks joining us from Canada. Uh, looks like uh, Senegal. Uh, let's see, Egypt as well, a place I visited many years ago. So that's cool. Colombia. Uh, let's see, Turkey. Uh, what else do we have in here? Uh, Casablanca, Morocco. Wow, that sounds good. Uh, on and on it goes. Uh, looks like I even saw uh, Brazil as well uh, and Rio. So, man, really glad to to have all of you joining us. It's always so uh, exciting to see uh, so many names and, and folks joining the conversation. So thanks for, for being here. So we're going to go ahead and jump into our uh, topic today, which really revolves around 
the completion side of uh, of the of oil and gas and drilling, uh, really on the completion side, excuse me, and so uh, specifically well completion. And so we're going to go ahead and bring in today's subject matter expert or uh, is uh, Vijay Kumar uh, Kirdifasan, and uh, he is joining us live now. Hey, Vijay, thanks for for joining us, and, and let everyone know where you're joining us from in the world. Hey, Michael, thanks for having me. So I'm joining in from Stavanger in Norway. And uh, yeah, it's a great sunny day in October in Norway. Yeah, so. yeah. It, again, another place I visited many years ago, but when I did visit, the weather was just as you described, and uh, I understood the uh, beauty and uh, really captivating uh, aspect of fjords. So now I understand why uh, why they're so special. So great. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us, VJ. So we're just going to kind of jump right in uh, to sure. today's uh, topic. I know that you are uh, the, uh, engineering manager for completion tools. And, uh, so we're going to be talking about a specific technology today. Uh, actually, uh, react is the name of the product that we're going to be talking about. I know that's part again of the completion tools, uh, business unit. So can you maybe start off by helping folks who aren't familiar, understand what is, what it, the react technology is and, and what does it, what does it do? How does it play a role in the completion side? Yeah, sure thing. So React basically stands for Remote Activated Technology, and it's an NOV patented technology which comprises of a suite of tools which are run as an integral part of the completion string and are permanently installed downhole. The beauty with this technology is that this technology allows you to remotely operate and actuate these tools without actually doing uh, any intervention. So typically what you have in, in uh, the traditional way of manipulating completion products downhole is you would have interventions, you know, you go in on a wireline or a coil and do certain uh, manipulations with them. But this is an electronic way of uh, approaching the problem where, you know, these can be pre-programmed to uh, actuate uh, without needing any intervention. Mm. So uh, I think that sounds really, really neat. And and um, I'm, I'm coming, my background's a little bit more on the drilling side, but I'm looking at this technology and uh, it looks like it's something that really has has uh, been been really thoughtfully developed and and uh, designed. Can you give me a little more uh, history or, or background on the technology? Maybe a little bit on the the track record of uh, of the React technology. Sure. So the React technology is uh, has mainly been used a lot in the offshore applications because you know that's one of the places where uh, the end user would gain a lot from using uh, going interventionless. So we have we have a track record of over 130 plus installations in regions such as offshore uh, North Sea, both the Norwegian and the UK side, and uh, more recently we've had quite a bit of uh, traction in in the Middle East where we've installed uh, several wells last year and are continuing to do so. So it's it's a really exciting growth period for the technology, I would say. Mm. So VJ, as someone who you know, day in and day out, and and actually in in your 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 title, you're you're really uh, in the the details of the the technology being in the engineering space. So if I'm someone who is coming to the table from maybe a, a, an operator or end user, uh, you know, from your perspective, why why would this be a, a piece of technology that I would want to to incorporate into my my program? What what are the what what would you tell someone who who maybe asked asked that pointed question to you? Yeah, I mean the the when I think about it, the value proposition of this technology, mm -hmm. I would say two main points, right? So the first one is uh, reducing rig time. So from, from an operator's point of view, one of the biggest chunks of their uh, operational expenditures is, is rig times. Rig rates can be as high as uh, half a million dollars or even more in some of the more uh, expensive to operate offshore areas in the world. And what this technology brings to the table is you don't need to actually have a rig online and go down with intervention. Mm -hmm on coil and do, do various things that you need to do. So suddenly you're you're talking about a whole lot of savings for the operators when it comes to reduce rig time. And the second sort of uh, uh, byproduct of this flexibility is that you're now able to maximize uh, production from the reservoir because this technology allows you uh, to, to kind of play around with your completion design in a way so that you can have good clean out of the well. Uh, and also you can have sequential startup of the well. Uh, and because you can do it all remotely, you know this gives more impetus for the for the end user to play around with completion design to get the maximum out of the well. So mm. these are the two main top things that come to my mind. 
No, I think that makes makes sense to me, and I appreciate the perspective. Uh, you know, one of the the other questions that came to my mind, um, you know, as as you were kind of talking about how these tools are are deployed, is really kind of understanding some of the methods to which these tools uh, uh, are really remotely activated. So I saw, you know, you have, obviously it's, there's some electronics uh, involved there, but can you talk about um, almost, so give me a, maybe a, a scenario, if you can almost kind of like walk me through it. How, how would you uh, utilize these? How would these be deployed and how would you um, uh, activate these, these tools? Could you, is that okay? Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I can I can definitely give a yeah. high level overview on that. Yeah. Uh, so the the basic idea is these tools are pre-programmed before you run them downhole. So you can imagine that we'd have a bunch of these uh, these products lying on the shelf, ready to be deployed. And then when you're ready to kind of run them for a particular well, what you do is you would hook it up to your computer through a USB and program the tool uh, to uh, through one of the methods that I'm going to talk about. And then once you've programmed it with your computer, the message is sent to the tool, then you're ready to you know run a downhole. So it's really kind of customizable and flexible and you can change it from well to well. So there, there are a few main ways of um, activating or programming this tool. Uh, so the first method is the timer method. And uh, we have a little example of a, of a clean out valve animation that's uh, that, that's hopefully I can walk through. Okay. So, so clean out valve is a React sleeve which is run in an open position and it can be remotely closed. So the way the clean out valves are typically run is we, we program them as a pure timer. So it's as simple as it sounds where you basically set the tool uh, to remotely close after X number of days. So in, in this particular example, what we have on the screen is you have the uh, clean out valve being run in the open position. And during when it's run in the open position, the, the production is all diverted through the clean out valve. So the solids and uh, the muds and any kind of unwanted particles in the production go through the clean out valve instead of plugging up your production screens. So that's the main benefit of the clean out mm -hmm. valve. And after about like 30 or 40 days of clean out, uh, the valve would just automatically close because that's what you have programmed it to do. So you didn't really have to raise a finger after 40 days, right? All of it happened right at the start when you were programming it. So, mm. so that's a simple timer-based scenario. Mm. Uh, but some in some applications, the the operator or customers want a bit more control than just a like an alarm clock-based timer system. So in those cases, we have kind of the more advanced version of the tool, which is a pressure pressure plus timer based control. So we, we have an example of that in a, in a React inflow valve animation. So when I talk about pressure signal, it's, it's a discrete pressure signal that the tool is uh, programmed to recognize. So there are pressure sensors part of the tool, which, is, uh, which can be programmed to read the well pressures all the time or during certain periods. Uh, so as an example, we can think of a React inflow valve, which is a valve sleeve, which is run in the closed position and can be remotely opened. So if you imagine a React inflow valve in a well, we have on the screen about five zones programmed to open, to react to a certain pressure signal. And as soon as they get the pressure signal, either they can open immediately or we can say, okay, once it sees the pressure signal after 10 minutes, uh, valve number one in zone one needs to open. After 20 days, valve two opens and so on. So over the period of the next you know, three, four months, the valves in the different zones from one to five sequentially open. What this brings to the table is that, you know, you might have a reservoir with different reservoir characteristics in the different zones. And this allows you to kind of sequentially start up the production of the well, again, without really having to, you know, do any intervention operation. So you, you kind of plan all of this upfront and you program these into these different tools that you're running in whole. And after, after like, 10 days from when it gets the signal, valve number two opens, then valve three opens after 25 days, and so on, and you get the maximum out of the reservoir. So mm -hmm. it's a really fun tool for the reservoir engineers to kind of play with the completion design. So I have a, a follow-up question for you, Vijay, but before I do that, uh, for those that just tuned in, we're talking to Vijay Kirdifasan. He is the uh, engineering manager uh, for completion tools, and we're talking about uh, React or the remotely activated technology for well completions. And uh, so he's our, our subject matter expert today. So if you have questions on, on this technology or any questions on 
some of the content ideas or concepts that uh, VJ uh, has been sharing with us. Feel free to put your question in the comment section, whether you're watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, and uh, we will try to get to your question uh, in just a little bit when we get to our Q&A portion. Um, but VJ, I wanted to circle around with you. So, so I understood, and that was that was really helpful to understand how the technology not only again is deployed, but how it can be uh, set in multiple types of operation. Just for those that might not be familiar, so so kind of juxtaposing the React technology with maybe a more maybe conventional approach. What what would that look like? Because to me, this this makes sense. It's it's automated. There are you know ways that I can interact with it. But if I didn't have the React technology, what what would I have to be considering in terms of additional either equipment or or processes in in the, in the overall operation from the completion side? Sure. So so in the in the case of of the inflow valve example that we just went through, where we have. Uh, you know, five different sleeves. These are pretty much installed in in the bottom of the well. So these are all the way at the bottom near the where the productive reservoir zone is. So in a traditional way, if you had to do the same thing, uh, you would have a intervention jobs plan. So you would go down uh, on on a wire line or a coil tubing on on those specific days or you know on a certain periods, and you would spend maybe 12 hours, 24 hours, depending on how you know how long it takes. And actually shift these using mechanical shifting tools. This is this is the more traditional way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And the thing with uh, I mean intervention is of course helpful, but there is always an associated logistics uh, that comes along with it. And also there is inherent risk. You know things things can get stuck while you're doing it, and this can again increase your rig time. So we're again kind of coming back to the whole uh, savings on the rig rate, uh, which is which is one of the big operational costs. Right. Right. No, that's that's good. So you and so you know we we saw the the animation which which showed the the technology uh, situated down hole. So I think you you may have mentioned that these are permanently installed down hole. And um, again, anybody that's familiar with with the world of uh, below the rotary tables, they say it, it's pretty. It can be a pretty harsh environment um, when you couple that with having some electronics. Uh, certainly something to to keep in mind. So how do you how do you and the team? How, do, how did you all kind of tackle that that challenge to make sure that the electronics um, really withstood that that harsh environment? Yeah, I mean that's a great question, which 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 gets asked pretty much uh, quite often. Anytime someone who's unfamiliar with this technology, mm -hmm. so it's important to kind of point out that the electronics we are talking about is is not. Uh, the standard uh, consumer grade electronics, but these are specifically designed electronics uh, which can withstand high temperature and high pressure environments uh, for really extended durations. So there, there's a few things that we have done during the development phase of this technology uh, to kind of validate that they are good for such harsh environments. We, we do what is called a halt testing, which is a highly accelerated lifetime test. Where we are taking the electronic modules and uh, and you know, putting them through brutal tests such as uh, shock and vibration tests with high G forces, all happening at temperatures as high as 350 Fahrenheit, and also we we have a long duration tests where we take uh, both the power module as well as the electronics and and have them uh, sitting at high temperatures for extended durations as as long as like uh, 50, 100, 200 days, and kind of monitoring their performance at different temperatures, uh, and one, one other thing to note that since these are permanently installed uh, tools in the, in the bottom of the well, it's really important to have contingency. Mm. Uh, uh, these are not intervention or drilling tools where you can quickly pull them up and change out uh, something if something in the electronics doesn't work. So we have a full contingency built into the tools. So all the electronics uh, in the tools have a full set of contingencies. So if any one set of electronics does not work, then you have a plan B, which is able to perform the same activity. Mm -hmm. and, and in completions, we're always thinking in terms of like plan A, B, and C because these are permanently installed uh, parts of the well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, maybe moving on, uh, uh, VJ, before we uh, get ready to transition to the the Q and A portion. Uh, I, I again, I know that uh, you and the team spend uh, quite a bit of time not only looking at ways to solve. Uh, the challenges of today, as as you've demonstrated with React, but also thinking ahead to the the challenges of of tomorrow and 
and beyond. So where do you envision the future of uh, really so what I, I guess you could consider smart completion uh, products like like React and so forth? Do you wh- how do you see that kind of looking down down the line as you've both had conversations with your your colleagues and and those outside of of NOV and uh, and maybe what would be some of the the challenges that that you see as well? Yeah, that's that's a that's a really valid question, and in this challenging circumstances, right? So it's important when when in times like these that we are kind of forward facing and future facing when it mm-hmm. comes to technology. So one of the things that often comes up when we talk uh, among the industry is digitalization of the oil field, and completion is is a part of that process as well, where uh, jewelry like like the React technology is going to form a you know a, a significant role in this uh, digital completions that that a lot of the operators envision. Uh, But one of the main challenges with having a lot of these digital electronics mud completions is going to be, how are you going to continue to power power them up uh, for long durations of time, you know, uh, for like five years, 10 years and so Mm -hmm. on. Uh, But when, when we think about it, the other aspect is that the battery or the energy storage technology has come a long way just in the last uh, five to 10 years. And it's not just the oil and gas industry that's kind of pushing the limits on energy storage, right? There's various energies, uh, sorry, there's various industries uh, that's kind of uh, demanding that the energy storage uh, technology gets better and better. And it is going to, and I know technologies like the React is going to be one of the beneficiaries of that. And there's also other stuff like, you know, like downhole power generation and charging things. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's coming and these are all things which are happening in the background uh, and it, it's going to come to fruition uh, eventually. That's that's where, the way I see it. Yeah, no, that and those uh, sound like really, really interesting uh, concepts and certainly something I know that you and the team uh, are, are keenly uh, focused on. So appreciate you sharing your perspective and uh, uh, speaking of sharing as as the adage goes sharing is caring so we want to care about our viewers and want to give them an opportunity to uh ask some of their questions uh of you vj so we're going to go ahead and bring in shelby domain again to get Mm -hmm. some of the questions that have been posed in the comment section so what do we uh what do we have shelby Absolutely. So we had some great conversation uh, in the comments. And this first question actually comes from uh, Jose on LinkedIn. And he's uh, wondering what experiences this have, uh, does process have in the unconventional um, uh, industry, more precisely in the shale oil and gas? Yeah, I think that's that's one of the areas of applications which, uh, which this can potentially be used in where uh, in the unconventional shale, what we are talking about is you typically have many zones that you uh, like to frack and stimulate one stage at a time. And uh, the number of stages, the requirement for that has in- grown a lot exponentially in the, in the last 10 years or so. And you know, technologies like this, which, which are remotely triggering uh, sleeves can, can definitely be used in those applications. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And, and Jose actually had another question that we're going to pull in here as well. Um, he's wondering, can it be applied in formations with a lot of pressure and uh, high temperature? Yeah, and, and that's the, that ties in with the Rick Key question, right? So these have been designed for HP, H3 environments, uh, and that's over the course of the product evolution. So so kind of the original version was not as high pressure and as high temperature as, as the version now is. And that's one of the things that we are continuously working on is pushing the boundaries of of the technology to go and, you know, perform in temperatures as high as 350 Fahrenheit and, you know, and high pressures as well. Right. And I'm wondering if if any of our rig geeks are paying attention, then they might, uh, then they can maybe get in some last minute uh, answers there. (laughs) Um, So this next question, this is one that we get a lot, actually. Um, and I know you had talked about, you know, having different plan A, plan B. Um, so this might, I think, is is what you hinted at, plan C. Uh, are there uh, mechanical contingency features built in? Yes. So all, all the React products have uh, mechanical contingencies built in them uh, because that's one of, uh, you know, from, from an end user point of view, they're always concerned that, uh, you know, there could be some challenges and with electronics the, because it's just a new, it's typically 
going away from the traditional way of doing it. So what we tell them is there's mechanical contingencies built in in all of our tools. So you know you can effectively do it the same way that uh, it has always been done. So you can go down with intervention and override the electronics and or use it as a plan C with with the with the electronics. Okay, so BJ, I don't know if you have any uh, any specifications, dimensions, or because uh, I know we always get folks that are like, "Hey, give me some of the the, the super detailed info." Uh, do you have anything off the top of your head that you could uh, share with with those that are viewing? And I know we'll we'll also direct them to the website, but because uh, I was looking at the, the the diagram that we saw, and so you know, I kind of started thinking through, you know, operating downhole or operating temperatures and you know, some of those things. Do you do you know any of that information that you could could share? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, we, we, like like you mentioned, uh, we, we have a series of uh, sizes of the different React products. Um, and they, the sizes ranges all the way from, uh, you know, three and a half inch mm. to and five eighth inch sizes covering sort of the standard uh, completion tubing sizes. Okay. And when it comes to pressures and temperatures, again, uh, you know, we, we are in the HPHD zone currently, uh, and we are pushing kind of doing a lot of long term testing to validate the performance of the tool at, at oh. these extreme conditions. Good, good. No, this is this is great. Um, so yeah, no, I, I I really appreciate. It. I think this is really um, really insightful uh, feedback. And uh, I, we, it looks like we had maybe one more question that came in, which, uh, which I, I think might be applicable. I don't know if you can talk to. So the question really was revolving around, uh, you know, can you use the, the React technology in, in multi stages? And, and if so, how does, how, does that, how does that work? Yes. So, so like, like we had in one of the animations, the, the neat part with it is you could have plenty of React products in the same uh, completion. And because it works on a discrete pressure signal, you can pre-program it so that the different React tools respond to re different unique uh, pressure signals. Mm. So that allows you to, you know, you can have a, a, a clean out valve in zone two and, and an inflow valve in zone three, and you can program them so that they both respond differently to the pressure signals or to different pressure signals. So that's, that's one of the neat things with the uh, pressure signal mode of uh, activating them. So is there a, a recommended maybe limit of number of stages uh, that you can have in, in one uh, kind of React uh, uh, string or, or is there uh, more, is that more uh, maybe field or, or, or well dependent? Yeah, I think, I think we kind of need to get uh, more in conversation with the customer about the details of right. this because it's going to depend on, on the application and how it's being used and okay. so on. Yeah. Okay. Great. No, that's that's great. I, I uh, really appreciate the insight and uh, the feedback on the React technology. Uh, and if uh, those watching would like to have more information on uh, the React tools, you can actually follow uh, follow the team on on LinkedIn. And I think the completion tools uh, team actually has a LinkedIn. Uh, affiliated page where you can find more information on the product and interact with uh, VJ uh, as well. So I think we'll be putting that information out. Actually, I want to bring Shelby in because she can probably talk to it even better better than I can because I don't I don't want to I don't want to drop the ball here. So Shelby, just just make sure. So is that right? So the the LinkedIn mm -hmm. kind of affiliated page is that right? Absolutely. So uh, a couple of places you can find it on LinkedIn. So it's actually tagged in the post for this video, um, as well as I just commented it below. So if you're in the comments, you can see um, a link to the, the completion tools page. Um, and then you can also always search completion tools on LinkedIn and uh, you'll look for the NOV logo and you'll be able to find them there. Okay, great, great. So there. So I didn't didn't <laughs> want to mess it up. So certainly uh, check them out on LinkedIn. And of course, we've got some uh, Traditional, good old fashioned email if you want to uh, to get in touch as well. So uh, definitely um, open to having conversation with uh, with the team on the React technology. So uh, been speaking with uh, Vijay Kumar uh, Kirdivasan, who is the engineering manager for Completion Tools. So uh, Vijay, thanks so much for taking the time and and answering these rapid fire questions for us today. Really, really interesting technology, and appreciate your your insight. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure.
All right, so we're going to go ahead and bring Shelby in to get the answer to uh, the tr the uh, Rig Geek post of the week, which of course was uh, part of, uh, of VJ's conversation mm -hmm. today as well, and he may have given a little bit of hint. So uh, mm -hmm. let's have that question again, Shelby, for for those that just can't get enough trivia in their day. <laughs> Absolutely, and and I always love when when our experts kind of hint uh, at the answer during, yeah. when they're talking. Uh, yeah. It's kind of like an I Easter know. egg in the show. Yeah. BJ was a pro. <laughs> he knew how to slip it right in. Absolutely. And so that question again was, according to the American Petroleum Institute, or API's definition of high pressure, high temperature well environments, what is the minimum required uh, temperature rating uh, and pressure rating to be considered uh, uh, high pressure, high temperature um, wells? And uh, I did actually see some guesses uh, in the comments. Some got really close. Um, I don't know if I saw one exact, but but maybe I just missed it. So let me know if I did. But but yeah, I saw a lot of people get really close. And the answer, which uh, uh, VJ uh, hinted towards or, or actually did mention, is 350 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 177 degrees Celsius, or, or 15,000 psi, uh, which is also 1,034 bar. Uh, so I, I always love our rigging because I appreciate y'all answering. And uh, I look forward to next week's rig geek question as well. Yeah, nope. Always, uh, always like learning these these little uh, fact tidbits. They uh, they'll one day they'll amount to maybe uh, maybe me winning winning some kind of trivia contest. I don't know. But yeah, maybe, maybe we'll I have a whole always, trivia. I only always answer. lose. Our our viewers are so good. They're always on top of it. So, uh, so that's great. Well, great. Well, thanks, Shelby. Appreciate your help there. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly, as always, thanks to you for joining us on this episode of NOV Live. We are always looking for your feedback and uh, and really your insight into how we can continue to make this something that is valuable to you. So if you have any, any comments, any questions or technologies that you would like for us to cover, feel free to send us an email and that'll be at socialmedia at NOV.com. And we are more than happy to engage in dialogue with you and see what we can do to bring uh, bring your perspectives and those technologies to the show. So we are uh, going to be wrapping up today's episode. But again, thanks for joining us. And on behalf of everyone here at NOV, thanks for watching and for listening. And we'll talk to you next time.